hi there. So my name is James. I, um, I'm here with Stacey and we are here for the SIT uh, video vlog, vlog that's going on, sorry. Um, so I just want to pass over to Stacey and, and she'll be able to introduce yourself um, to the camera and uh, let the people watching know a little bit about you, where you're studying currently, maybe what you studied before to get to where you are now. Um, so going over to you. Cool. Hi, I'm Stacey Muse. I'm a master's student. Uh, I'm doing my MSc. However, all of my research has pretty much done, been done at Flinders University in Adelaide, Australia, as part of an international collaboration between our labs. Excellent. And where were you at before you started your master's? Ah, uh, okay. So I did my undergrad in, uh, at the University of Calgary in Calgary. Um, and it was sort of an interdisciplinary program between it was sort of half biology and half energy science. So in that energy science, it included types of like wind power and solar power and nuclear power and things like that. Oh, so sort of like sort of all the energies sort of all together. Yeah, yeah. So I learned a little bit of physics and a little bit of radiation, and uh, it just sort of all naturally led into this interest in radiation and biology put together. Sweet, and then we moved over to master, master, and that's when you sort of really took off with radiation and started being like, yeah, this is what I want to do, this is where I'm going to go, let's start studying. And then you moved over to Australia. Yeah, yes. how good was so, that? <laughs> yeah. pretty, pretty amazing, I have to say. Yeah. Um, very thankful for my supervisor, Doug Borum, for providing that opportunity to me in mm -hmm. conjunction with my Australian supervisor, Danny Dixon. So Thanks. it's been very cool, yeah, for sure. So, start telling us a little bit about um, what you have been doing, what have you achieved, where, okay. where is your science going? Yeah. So, um, Dr. Danny Dixon's lab is associated with the ICCU in, at Flinders Medical Centre, so that's critical care medicine in which we have patients who are, um, sorry, um, <laughs> patients who are mechanically ventilated and also tend to have high rates of infection and uh, also undergo a lot of radio diagnostic procedures. So apparently there are physicians who are con concerned about this going, hey, we have patients who are really not healthy, but we're also exposing them to radiation at, you know, fairly regularly, um, possibly at high doses, high in the clinical sense. Um, and so they sort of asked, hey, is this an issue? So we figured we should probably look into it, um, decided to use an animal model to um, mimic patients and how they might be exposed to radiation and see how that affects their lungs because they're me mechanically ventilated as well as the spleen which is sort of addressing the infection and immunology side of things. Right, right. So it's, it's sort of like the overall is sort of trying to translate this sort of radiation background um, into a more clinical aspect for these doctors yeah. that are a little bit unsure of what's sort of going on because yeah, that's exactly. not their discipline, you know? So it's sort of just in a nutshell, how could clinical radiation possibly be affecting the lungs and immune system? Right, right. And is your Australian collaborator, are they um, radiation as well, or are they something completely different? Uh, are so they, how are you mixing it together? They come sort of from more of a medical background in terms of lung physiology and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so radiation research is relatively new, but um, we have some local experts who are helping to make that transition and blend it together, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Make it more uh, understandable for those who aren't un understanding of it. And, but I can assume that someone in ICU, is, they're there for a reason, like they're, they're, they're sick. So yeah. you, want to, you want to be given the best treatment and, and you know, diagnostic medicine to try and figure out what's going on. That's obviously a valid Absolutely. part. Absolutely. Um, so let's delve in a bit deeper. Um, you said that you were doing an animal model, yep. looking at lungs and immunology. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so what sort of experimentals did you do there? What sort of procedures did you go through? Okay, so um, <clears throat> we use uh, rats as our animal model because they tend to have a more normal immune system, as it were. So some yeah. of the concerns with using mice, which is what most people use, there's some oddities with certain strains because they're so highly inbred, they've developed potentially odd immune responses. Yeah, I heard they haven't really had the um, immunity to go back with that. So. Um, yeah, we, we, we have chosen to expand more into the rats, um, the spreg dollies in particular. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to 
be a good animal model. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Was there difficulty in trying to choose that animal model? Like, obviously, for the for the research well, in immunology, yeah, um, rats are working better than mice. But in I don't know that I would say better because there are definitely challenges in terms of um, <laughs> getting antibodies and various uh, things like yep. that, right? So um, it's not as available on that side of things, mm -hmm. but um, it's well established in their lab. They have an uh, acute lung injury model that they've been using for a long time, and they've they've it's it's a model that works well for them. Okay, so in this acute lung injury model, are you guys looking um, more so at the sort of the short range of of what radiation would do, or are you looking at weeks, like long term, like everyone? A lot of work here being happening with cancer in long weeks. Yeah, so. yeah, no. So um, <laughs> given the nature of uh, ICU care being quite acute, we aren't looking currently at long-term effects such as cancer or yeah. even medium-term effects such as fibrosis. We'd like to get into like some of the um, mechanistic aspects of that that might lead to fibrosis, but we're focusing currently, I'm just establishing the model and all the protocols and everything yeah. on the first 24 hours. So we have three time points, half hour, four hours, and 24 hours, and looking at a variety of endpoints within that time frame. Excellent. And with those time points, are they relevant to ICU in some way, or is it um, relevant in, in, in another aspect? Like, why was it 30 minutes? Why was it 24? Or is it just like So that's that sort of looking at yeah. acute immune response that might be occurring. Um, oh, so, so it's sort of yeah. like you want to find out what's happening right away, and then um, four hours later, you might see different dynamics. And then within the first day, it's there's a whole lot that can change within those 24 hours, especially mm -hmm. when you're looking at molecular things. Is this acute lung injury something that you go into ICU with, or is it while you're there? Uh, a little of both, actually. So oh, okay. um, you may find, or patients may find themselves in ICU because they have acute lung injury, right. or they may develop it while they're there because of um, the mechanical ventilation or infection. So, like. 50% of infections that occur in your average ICU, not RC, ICU, um, <laughs> Good <back> are <laughs> actually um, pneumonia, for example. So okay. um, that can cause some serious Hospitals, issues. yeah, yep. there's a lot going around. That makes sense. Um, okay, so we've, we've sort of understood that now you're looking at immunology as well as radiation and, and the lungs particularly because they're ventilated and there's a lot of work in the ICU. Um, so what did we find when we were looking in your rat model with lungs? Okay, so, so good news, uh, everything up to 20 milligray, there seems to be no effect, totally normal. Um, pulmonary edema is not, uh, um, there's a word I'm looking for, evident, I guess. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's no pulmonary edema, there's no <coughs> um, decrease in oxygenation, which you would see if the lungs weren't doing their job properly. Um, the <clears throat> infiltration of proteins and cells into the lungs that occurs with acute lung injury is not in any way evident. And uh, some of the respiratory mechanics, yeah. uh, so airway resistance as well as tissue resist, sorry, tissue elastance are totally normal. We did see an interesting trend in increasing tissue resistance, not in any way statistically significant. However, it's something that we're sort of, because our hypothesis is that there is no effect, we have to address that and kind of go, hey, is there actually something going on here? If it is, what could possibly be happening? But that was only seen at about 200 milligray, which is okay. at the upper level of a dose you'd expect with a single procedure of yep. radio, radio diagnostics. Good, you've sort of like sparked a few questions there. So on that right. note, what, what levels of radiation, before we get there actually, um, I'm a little confused. You're saying you're doing an animal model, mm -hmm. um, looking at acute lung injury and giving radiation. Um, so these animals are like sick, uh, like you're making them sick and then okay, giving them so to ICU to look the same? Interesting question, actually, because I'm establishing a healthy animal model just to start with. So um, our future work will involve infecting or uh, inducing acute lung injury in the animals and then irradiating them to see how that affects things. But since right. this is all very new, I was just establishing baseline immunological and physiological responses. Yeah. And so we're using this healthy animal model. So that actually kind of makes it more interesting in that you can expand that to the general public. Mm -hmm. Anybody who may be um, exposed to radiation through 
whatever means, whether it's they have a CT scan for unrelated like non-lung injury reasons or anything like that, yeah, you yeah. can still There's apply this to okay. them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're, you're sort of settling up the baseline and then someone yeah, exactly. after following you will, will come in with the, with the these ICU people are sick, so let's look at the sick versus that. Yeah. You definitely need to have that sort of control sort of level to be able to revert back to to see something. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. Um, okay, so what doses were you giving? And okay, uh, right. so choices, why? Looking at a sort of broad-ish range of uh, clinically relevant doses. Yep. So we did zero to 20 and 200 milligray. So 20 milligray being the middle one is sort of like what you might get with a standard CT scan on the higher end. So it's sort of like 10 to 20 milligray, give or take. Um, a chest x-ray by comparison is 0.02 milligray. So that's, that's even low. below where I'm looking. And a lot of people are like, wow, those are really low doses. But yeah. we're trying to keep it very clinically relevant. And then the 200 Trans was sort of there as this is sort of the upper limit we see people getting, as well as being above the limit where like uh, often radiation research uh, below 100 milligray, it's really hard to tell what's going on. So yeah. I was sort of aiming for something just beyond that. So if we were to see something, that seemed likely. And it turns out there are possibly some little, little things going on. Right, so let's get on to that. Uh, not really an expert in, in lung physiology or um, particularly me mechanics, that we said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, function. Um, you mentioned a couple of terms and you said that there was some sort of possible difference. Yeah. Any hint or like one liner into ex explanation of those? for the viewers that don't understand or from that background? Okay, so <laughs> lung mechanics is really quite complicated and uh, we were fortunate yeah, enough to have uh, a, a pretty much world leading expert on this in, oh, in our research group. Um, and so there's sort of two major aspects of lung mechanics uh, that we measure using forced oscillation technique. And this is a technique in which we are already ventilating the animals, so they're mm -hmm put under, they are not in any way aware of anything happening, um, and essentially uh, forces a, ver a variety of frequencies of air into the lungs, so high frequency and low frequency can actually reflect off of the lung at different depths, so like some are targeted at the upper respiratory, others are mm -hmm. more lower into the ends of the branches, mm -hmm. and this computer-controlled ventilator can then take that information and tell you about the health of the lung. So two of the major sort of uh, aspects of sort of, um, I guess, inefficiencies in the lung are uh, airways resistance and tissue resistance. So right. with any sort of fluid moving through a pipe, like you have air moving through your airways yeah. and your lungs, right. there's some resistance there. So there's some energy loss. And if you were to say have asthma or anaphylactic shock, the airways close up a bit and that massively increases the resistance. So that would be an example of a sort of hypersensitivity response causing uh, inefficiencies in the lung, which makes it harder to breathe. Okay. Right? Yep. Um, then the other side of that is sort of, you are actually, like the lungs expand, <clears throat> excuse me, the lungs expand a massive amount when you have to breathe in. It's, it's yeah. impressive to me still that <laughs> it's, it, it makes a huge difference. And so they have to be able to expand in order to accommodate a volume of air. And that means that the tissues have to expand and stretch and all of this, and they're fighting several different forces going on in there. And so um, tissue resistance is sort of the inefficiencies in that expansion process. Okay. So you might have some stiffness in the lung due to, say, fibrosis. So with radiation pneumonitis, with higher doses of radiation, they see that um, that causing issues, and therefore that also increases the work of breathing. So that one little sort of 200 milligray, possibly something going on, seems to be in that aspect of it. However, tissue resistance is also only about seven percent of the overall lung function, and so it's important to keep in mind that this is a very small change, maybe, in a very small portion of the lung function. So I'd say that's still very reassuring that there's not really any adverse effects from mm -hmm. this radiation in terms of the lungs. We haven't even gotten into the spleen yet. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the only thing that you, you've, you've possibly seen a change in um, that's not significant, is that what you said? 
It's not statistically not significant. Not statistically, no. Yeah. Um, is about the stiffness of lung or the ability of the lung to stretch and, and breathe and, and go in and out, yeah? yeah? The other two are pretty Everything much even. Right. And this was only with the highest dose? Only with the highest dose. Yeah, yeah. so that's the one that um, you said was not someone in the ICU would get for... Mm, they might get in... Like their stay? Their stay, yeah. Oh, okay. Totally, no worries. Um, and was there anything else jumping out in the lung? Was obviously like... Um, with some higher doses, you can get some you know, protein into the lung or some cells or... Yeah, no, none of that. It none was of all that was fine, happening. Totally normal. So we all these low doses yeah. are given nothing? Yeah, basically. What? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> I mean, it's definitely good, good news. Results. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can calm down about getting a chest x-ray, I think. Um, cool, so you've done a bit of the, the lung work and then you said that you've also got some spleen, so tell us a bit about that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so... The spleen, um, there's actually been some interesting research previously about um, low doses possibly inducing an increased proliferative response of the cells in the spleen. So I thought that was really interesting because it's sort of tying into the possibility of, oh, there might be some hormesis going on. It's like, hey, it's priming your immune system to deal with stuff. So I mean, with cancer immunotherapy, we recognize that's really important. And it's just sort of, I mean, that's clearly beyond the purview of the ICU, but I thought it was really interesting. And I thought it was really cool. And yeah. I decided we should probably check this out in addition to making sure, obviously, that it's not bad for the patients. Okay. Um, so uh, in order to look at that, we removed the spleen, processed it to remove all or to extract all the cells and then cultured those cells with and without stimulus for 48 hours. So um, we used two different stimulants, LPS and CON-A. Um, these cause the cells to proliferate normally. Um, and so then we compared the cell viability at one hour and 48 hours. Okay. Yeah. Of culture with or without these stimulus. Yep. And uh, we found actually that after 200 milligray radiation in vivo, these cultured cells had a reduced proliferative response, but only in the cells that were stimulated with CON-A. CON-A is? That's one of the stimulants. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So there was radiating the cells, then you stimulated them No, no, we them radiate the whole animal. A whole we body. don't irradiate the cells afterwards. So there are definitely some research, some research out there where they remove the cells, then irradiate them. This was, okay, oh, whole body irradiation. after they've been whole body irradiated, right. take them out and then see how they respond. Okay, cool. So there was so. not a, there was a less sort of effect of the proliferation of these cells because they'd been irradiated. Yeah, so normally they would sort of um, double or triple over that 48 hours, but these ones were less proliferative. Okay. So, I mean, this could be due to increased apoptosis as opposed to a decreased proliferative response. We don't know which cells these are yet, so we still have a lot of work to do to check out the intricacies of that. Okay, so there's still work going on. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. So just quickly, yeah. that was with all the doses or just? Just the 200 milligrams. Just the 200. So just this high one seems to be just doing this high one, a little bit, like if maybe anything. Maybe something going on. We want right. to look into it a little further. It's in no way clear that this would have a negative impact yeah. on patients. Cool, so two questions Still, yeah. going moving on. Mm -hmm. um, first off, what are you going to be just, just finishing up sort of where, where you want to end up in, in, in radiation or not, or mm -hmm. um, continuing on there? And then secondly, what do you expect to see in the model that's going to be following you? Okay, so there's a couple different models we'd like to move on towards with this. Yep. Um, there's uh, acute lung injury and seeing if then radiation can modify the response in there. So Let's mimicking see. sick patients. Yeah. Um, we'd also like to look at multiple irradiations, given that these patients don't get just one single dose. They get several, so what happens when you break it down that way? Yep. And I would really like to look at more long-term, sort of even just like one, three, seven days or several weeks or months later. But I mean, this is, this is sort of the end of my project, given that I'm wrapping up my master's thesis now. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be the next steps to look at. Excellent. Well, congratulations on what you found. Oh, it seems you. like you've got, got a lot of results there that um, are showing that radiation is not really doing anything at that level, which is, which I suppose when you translate that back to a doctor who may be a little bit yeah, unsure. Yeah, yeah. Um, now that, have an answer for them. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, good luck with the rest that you're going to be doing. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for coming. <laughs>